welcome to this um, Dermatology Clinical Club. We normally, uh, we've been running these sessions for um, some some years really, and we normally um, have these at the building, obviously, um, but uh, this is the first time that we're trying to do them in a webinar format. Now, it does create a few challenges because we would normally run these sessions um, as a small group sort of interactive, very relaxed session whereby small groups can sit around computers, work through a few clinical cases, and then afterwards we go through and discuss them all um, in a sort of relaxed fashion. Um, for, for the purpose of tonight, what I'm going to do is present five cases to you, um, all with the sort of theme of, of the immune system. And I hope they're going to be uh, useful for you. I've deliberately tried to pick things that I think you will see from time to time, nothing too obscure, but at the same time, nothing too run of the mill either. Um, and I'm going to present to them, you to them, but if you, obviously if you have any questions, please do uh, just fire them into that chat box and we'll um, run through them um, at the end. Okay. So my first case um, is a dog called Finn. And he um, was, well, so I, when I saw him, he was a two-year-old male neutered Cocker Spaniel, working Cocker Spaniel, absolutely lovely dog. Um, I'm massively biased because I have a working Cocker Spaniel myself, but this was, really was a lovely dog. And he presented with a two-month history of non-peritic alopecia. But he was otherwise completely well, and I really can't emphasise that enough, that this dog was running around the console room with a tennis ball in his mouth with, you know, no cares in the world at all. And he really, the owners had no other concerns about this apart from this two-month history of non-peritic alopecia, and they were really sure this was non-peritic as well. The alopecia had been um, seen to start on the bridge of the nose, so that's a slightly odd place to uh, develop alopecia, and the alopecia over the two months had started to spread um, out over the face, um, around the eyes and onto the ear pinny. And then recently, just prior to coming for referral, the, the owner had noticed a few patches of alopecia dotted throughout uh, the coat of the trunk. Bit of relevant history, um, the owners have been very diligently giving uh, Finn uh, monthly a Foxalina and Milbomycin oxine, which uh, goes by the name of uh, Nexgard Spectra. Um, so very good uh, and regular parasite control. And prior to referral, he had um, been given some topical betamethasone, and that hadn't really made any difference at all. And because there'd been a bit of a concern about uh, a possible fungal um, involvement, uh, the vets had also tried some enylconazole vinces um, over the affected sites, uh, but this had also not seemed to make um, a difference. So here is Finn. This was him sat in the consult room um, on the first presentation. And, um, you know, you can clearly see that he's got this, uh, these areas of um, alopecia um, over the bridge of the nose, uh, extending up to, uh, onto the top of the head between the eyes. Um, and you can see that it's sort of going around the eyelids as well. Um, it's also on the ear pinny at this stage, although it's quite difficult to see that in this photo. You'll see that in, in the next photo. Um, I guess something that's just um, worth pointing out at this point is if you look at the nasal planum, um, that does not appear to be um, affected um, at, at, in, in this particular case. Um, and the eyelids themselves and the eyes also look relatively unaffected. It's more the sort of skin surrounding, um, but, but certainly uh, very alopecic. This was the dog um, a, a few weeks later. Um, and you can see just how this has progressed. So um, marked alopecia, and um, hopefully you can see in these photos that we also have uh, quite a degree of scaling as well. So particularly, uh, hopefully you might be able to see my um, computer mouse, kit, um, mouse um, pointer here, um, particularly around the edges of these ear pinnies, we've got quite a degree of scaling um, uh, as, along with the marked alopecia. Uh, it doesn't look particularly inflammatory, uh, but that's obviously hard to tell on a microscopic level. Um, quite scaly also on the bridge of the nose here, uh, but again you can see that this nasal planum actually looks pretty healthy. You've got a normal cobblestone architecture there. Uh, we don't seem to have any crusting, we don't seem to have any depigmentation. So we need to formulate a problem list. Um, now in this case it's uh, relatively straightforward um, and that is one of non-peritic alopecia and um, you know we, we were quite certain that this was genuinely non-peritic um, in this case. Obviously if you were unsure, you could potentially go doing some hair plucks from these affected sites to see whether there was any evidence of fractured hair shafts that might uh, support uh, there being a, a degree of pruritus. But uh, in this case, it was definitely not peritic. So we need to think some differential diagnoses for non-peritic 
um, alopecia. And when thinking about non-teritic alopecia, one of the um, best ways of sort of starting off um, the, the list is to think about whether the problem is congenital or acquired. Well, this is a two-year-old dog who had had a completely normal hair coat prior to the onset of this problem. So this was very clearly an acquired problem. So we need to think about the, the, the differentials for acquired non-peritic alopecia. So these are the sort of list of differentials that I um, could come up with. Um, infectious causes are very common. Uh, we certainly see bacterial folliculitis um, extremely common in the clinic. Uh, dermatophytosis would also be not uncommon um, in some situations. Uh, certainly demodex mites. And then rarely, um, certainly at, the, at our hospital, leishmaniosis um, could be on the list, but um, that would be higher in, in an animal that would obviously travel to uh, Mediterranean countries. Uh, Immune-mediated causes could certainly uh, be on the list, so things like alopecia areata, sebaceous adenitis, and potentially post-injection alopecias. There are some miscellaneous alopecia disorders, such as um, the neoplastic condition, I suppose uh, I'm mainly thinking about cutaneous epitheliotrophic lymphoma. Uh, that would be unusual in a two-year-old dog, but not impossible. Um, telogen um, effluvium is an unusual um, excessive shedding condition that normally follows some weeks after a stressful event, um, or such as pregnancy or a general illness. Anagen effluvium tends to follow on from cytotoxic drugs uh, that interrupt uh, the anagen growth phase of the hair cycle. So some of these would be quite unlikely given uh, the history uh, certainly telogen and anagen effluvium would be, would be very unlikely. Um, as would endocrine disease, though obviously we think about endocrine disease as a pretty uh, common cause of non peritic alopecia. But this is a two-year-old completely well dog with no other supportive clinical signs. And alopecia obviously started on the, the bridge of the nose, so not really the classic sort of presentation of what we might expect for the endocrine alopecias. So I think that would be quite unlikely and be, would be further down the list at this point. Finally, um, we do have follicular dysplasias, and they can either be coat colour linked or non coat colour linked, which I suppose would potentially be on the list, but uh, the working cocker spaniel is not a breed that is predisposed to any of the breed associated dysplasias, and the distribution pattern is not typical um, of, of that sort of group of diseases. So, Diagnostic tests would be next, and we always pick a diagnostic test based on that list of differentials to try and help rule in or rule things out. So it, it certainly wouldn't be wrong in this case to perform some surface cytology, that might be done with something like a tape impression, just to check that we didn't have a degree of bacterial infection um, present at, at these sites. I think it'd be quite unlikely um, because we're not, we're not seeing pustules, and also pyoderma on the face is actually quite unusual. Um, but certainly if you're being thorough, then that would definitely not be wrong. Skin scrapings and hair pluckings would be performed to help rule out uh, demodicosis, and um, hair plucks could also be useful potentially to see any evidence of uh, dermatophytosis invading the, the hair shafts. Um, along with that, you might also um, perform wood zamp examination, and you may or may not uh, consider dermatophyte culture uh, to be uh, important at this stage. Dermatophytosis um, is quite rare in dogs, but they do, um, or there's some dogs, particularly with inquisitive natures, um, do or can, can develop facially uh, orientated uh, dermatophytosis due to species like trichophyton, um, and therefore that would need to be on the list. If that, if, well, if that delegate could just pop their microphone on to mute, that would be great, if that's okay. Uh, now, Finn's tests were all negative, and therefore we didn't have any evidence of uh, an infectious cause, so really nothing uh, clear at all. Now, if you then go back to the list of differentials, really, I'll just pop back to them now, really, if we've ruled out these infectious causes, we're left with immune-mediated miscellaneous and follicular dysplasias, well, really, all of those conditions are going to need histopathology uh, to, to get a diagnosis. So next step um, in a case like this, uh, once you've ruled out those common things, it would be a biopsy. So some of you may may have your suspicions of what might be going on uh, with this dog, um, but in this case, uh, histopathology was, was nice and conclusive and was able to diagnose the condition sebaceous adenitis. Now, this is something that I'm sure um, some of you will have seen, um, some of you may not have seen, but sebaceous adenitis is um, a, a presumed immune-mediated condition whereby 
um, we get inflammation targeting the sebaceous glands associated with the hair follicles. So what the pathologist will see uh, is inflammation really focused around those sebaceous glands in the early stages. And it's normally one of those diseases whereby um, you will get a definitive answer on your biopsies. If you bi diagnose uh, this late on and you take the biopsies late in the disease course, sometimes all the pathologist will see is an absence of sebaceous glands because they've just been completely wiped out by that inflammation. But that's still diagnostic because obviously it's very abnormal to, for, for a hair dog uh, to not have any sebaceous glands. So it is normally something you'll, you'll get an answer on. There are some breeds that are predisposed to sebaceous adenitis. We see it more in breeds like poodles, uh, vizslas and cheetahs. Um, I don't think I've ever seen it in another working cocker spaniel, but it just emphasises that we don't really know what causes this. Yes, we might have some breed associations, but it can really be seen in any breed of dog. Um, and actually recently I've diagnosed it in a St. Bernard as well. So um, it does need to be on the list of um, our, on our list of differentials for non pruritic alopecia. Interestingly, um, it often does start around the head and neck area and extend cordially over the trunk. So in that sense, uh, this actually was uh, fairly typical um, of this condition. And because we're getting wipe out of those sebaceous glands, we do see alopecia and we do see dryness and scaling um, of the hair coat and the skin. So that's why we have this uh, degree of scaling. So treatment, well, this isn't a condition that can be cured. We don't know what triggers this. So therefore, a cure is not possible. We need to manage these cases um, as best as possible. And because the skin is lacking the natural oils and because it's very dry, these dogs are quite susceptible to secondary uh, bacterial infection. So um, often um, things like clorexidine washes need to be part of the treatment regime um, to, to help prevent those. Otherwise, cases generally are managed with um, topical therapy to help remove the scale, improve the condition of the hair and coat uh, with things like moisturising shampoos and rinses. And then we also often couple that with some sort of oral medication as well. Now, it's quite hard to make sort of generalised uh, advice about which type of shampoos you should use because it really depends on the patient as to whether you really need to remove the scale more first or whether they really just need more moisturising products. But uh, generally, uh, it's a combination of, of, of shampoos um, and rinses to try and um, improve the condition of, of the coat. Some dogs can also benefit from essential fatty acids by mouth. So uh, we do often add those in as well. And then um, in dogs that are more severe or need more, because mild cases of this potentially could just be managed more with the sort of topical therapy and fatty acids. Um, all of vitamin A, um, which has effects on the keratinization process, has been reported to be effective for uh, some dogs. Cyclosporin is probably the treatment of oral treatment that is of choice uh, these days because it's been shown to be quite effective at removing or reducing the inflammation associated with this condition um, and although expensive, um, it is normally the, the thing to, to go to in, in these more severe cases. Synthetic retinoids I just put at the bottom uh, because they very rarely get used, partly because they are quite uh, potentially quite dangerous to, to handle for humans. They are teratogenic um, for both dogs and humans. Um, and so if they're accidentally ingested by humans, the, the ramifications of that can be uh, catastrophic. So um, it's, that's a group of dogs that we would really um, avoid against using. And I don't think I've ever had to use those for this condition uh, before. So in Finn's case, uh, we started him on um, a Duxo range of uh, shampoos, Duxo Seb shampoo. Um, you probably have your own uh, favourite sort of ranges of shampoos, but I quite like the Duxo range. Uh, we also started him on oral essential fatty acids, and if my memory serves me correctly, I think we went for via Qtam. And then he also went on to oral cyclosporin, uh, the daily dose. And Generally, um, the way I've managed these cases is to use cyclosporin uh, to, uh, and that combination to try and get them as good as you possibly can and then see whether you can ease back on the, the frequency and amounts you're giving of the cyclosporin, uh, which would obviously help in terms of costs for the owner. So that's what uh, Finn looked like before. And here's just a sort of after photo that was sent to me uh, during treatment. Um, this was not all that long ago. Um, so you can see here that Finn um, clearly looks better, um, not perfect, uh, granted he obviously still has this area of alopecia over the bridge of the nose. And that's sort of interesting to think why that might still be the case. 
Uh, that might be because the hairs are not cycling properly, or it might be because there's a degree of scarring and alopecia from the inflammation. Uh, you'd probably have to biopsy that area again uh, to find that out. Um, but um, obviously many owners are not keen to do that. Um, but I think you'll all agree that generally he's, he does look a lot better. Um, and we don't have any of that scaling and dryness anymore. So the actual condition of the skin looks a lot better. Okay, now moving on to uh, case number two. Now, just because um, I'm just going to check the technology is working okay, I'm just going to very briefly stop sharing my screen for a second just to make sure that we're not leaving any other people waiting um, out in the um, lobby area of here. No, looks like everyone's still there. That's good. Right, so we can carry on again. Okay, so Missy, she is a four-year-old female neutered border terrier. And she presented with a three month history of crusting and depigmentation on the nasal planum. Uh, she had no lesions anywhere else on her body. And she'd actually had biopsies taken from her nose uh, prior to being uh, referred to, to our hospital. And biopsies had demonstrated a predominantly lymphocytic lichenoid interface dermatitis with basal cell apoptosis, vacuolar degeneration, and pigmentary incontinence. Now, Probably for many people that will just seem like utter bubble gook and sort of pathology speak, but basically a, a lichenoid interface dermatitis tells us we've got a band of lymphocytes um, underneath the, the epidermis forming a band just at that junction between the epidermis and dermis. And because of the interface dermatitis, it's actually um, targeting that junction between the epidermis and dermis. The basal cells are also dying off, the basal cells of the epidermis, so that's the bottom layer of the epidermis, that's what that means. And vacuolar degeneration means that those basal cells are showing um, edema. Pigmentary incontinence refers to the fact that we've got pigment, which is normally in that basal layer of the epidermis, it's dropping down into the dermis, which is why clinically we see depigmentation in these interface diseases. So it sort of makes sense. Uh, what the pathologist is describing there makes sense as to what we can see on the animal. So this is what she looked like, a uh, very close up view of her nose. Now, um, I appreciate you've probably seen worse, worse nose, noses than this um, in, in practice, but um, her, her owner was obviously not happy about this. Um, she used to have a jet black nose and hopefully you can appreciate that her uh, nasal planum has gone a sort of diffuse snake grey colour. Um, we don't have any sort of erosions or fissures or ulcers, but we do have um, a degree of crusting uh, along the top here, a little bit of scaling or hyperkeratosis along the sort of top uh, of the nasal planum here. But we definitely have lots of pigments uh, around um, the, the, the sort of rostral areas here, um, almost becoming a bit whitish, really, um, by, by the filter. Um, the keen eyed amongst you will hopefully just about make out that we're, we are actually losing the normal nasal architecture. So that normal cobblestone appearance of the nasal venum um, is is just not is just not there um, in, in this um, in, on this nose. It's just got a very sort of smooth, shiny um, appearance. So what's our problem list for this dog? Well, we've got deep irritation and we've got crusting. Um, on the nasal planum. I think I think one of the delegates has still got the microphone um, on. So if any of them, if you can hear me OK, you just need to go into the middle of your screen and make sure that there's a diagonal line going through the microphone icon, because I think we can still hear a bit of background noise. OK, so crusting and deep pigmentation on the nasal planum. So this is the list of differentials that I could come up with. Uh, for this sort of presentation. So discoid lupus erythematosus or DLE would certainly be high on the list. We've got a dog that has lesions and restricted to this site. The dog doesn't have any other problems anywhere else. Uh, its systemic counterpart, systemic lupus erythematosus, essentially produces skin lesions that are pretty identical. But what we don't have in this case is any other evidence of the other systemic signs that we should be seeing to, to be able to diagnose SLE. So that would be quite unlikely in this particular dog. Mucocutaneous pyoderma is an unusual and controversial, somewhat controversial condition whereby we get a bacterial infection at the mucocutaneous junctions, which can actually look very, very similar to DLE. So that does need to be on the list. 
Pemphigus foliaceus is the most common variant of Pemphigus that we will see in dogs, and that can cause these sorts of changes to a, a nose, so need to be on the list. Pemphigus erythematosus is a more facially uh, predominant variant um, of Pemphigus. Um, it's a bit of a crossover condition between Pemphigus foliaceus and DLE. So it's on the list, um, although um, I, I don't think I've actually personally seen a case of that, so it's very rare. Dermatophytosis. Now, this is on the list because it could be a cause of crusting and hyperkeratosis around the, the, the bridge of the nose and, and can extend onto the nasal planar, but it would be lower down on this because it doesn't really explain the depigmentation and doesn't really explain the, the lack of or the loss of cobblestone architecture. Vitiligo um, is a depigmenting condition, but it, it really shouldn't be causing the crusting, it shouldn't be causing the loss of nasal architecture, so it's in brackets because that's not really how this uh, that, that condition presents. Trauma um, is on the list because actually many owners will think that their dog has, with, with these sorts of problems, will have, tra will have traumatized their noses by sniffing in places or putting it into, I don't know, rabbit holes or something like that that might have damaged uh, the nose. So it's a, I think that's very commonly thought of, but actually in reality, that's probably a very unlikely cause of this sort of presentation. And then finally, we have uh, this Voigt Koyanagi Harada like syndrome um, or VKH like disease, otherwise known as UVO dermatologic syndrome, which is another depigmenting disorder, um, usually seen in northern breed dogs, I must say, not border terriers. Um, but this condition will usually go hand in hand with ocular changes like uveitis. Um, and this dog, um, Missy, has no other problems. So it's, that's very unlikely and it's low down on that list. So, quite a few differentials to consider. Having said that, um, in this case, the histopathology demonstrating that we have an interface dermatitis, uh, a lichen with interface dermatitis, coupled with the localised clinical signs, is enough to make uh, a diagnosis of discoid cutaneous lupus erythematosus, or DLE. Having said that, though, it is quite, quite well known that pathologists do have a, a job of differentiating DLE from mucocutaneous pyoderma on histopathology. So it does often then come back to us as clinicians to be able to differentiate these two conditions. And that then comes back to what we might have, to, as part of our therapy, we might have to factor in some initial treatment for uh, a possible bacterial infection to see whether it resolves uh, with those measures. Um, if it does, it may have been a pyoderma. If it doesn't, you probably are have you probably are left with DLA as a confirmed diagnosis. You could potentially consider a dermatophyte culture in a case like this as well, um, but it, as I said, it probably wouldn't be high on my list of things to do because in this case you've already got histopathology demonstrating that interface dermatitis and that's not consistent with uh, dermatophytosis. So treatment options. So there are various treatment options for DLE. Now, I'll just mention the thing at the bottom to start with. So I mentioned that sometimes if we're unsure, we do have to consider that we might need to do a trial uh, with some antimicrobial measures, first of all. Uh, another thing that you could do um, to um, raise your index or suspicion of, of infection would be to do some cytology from the nose. So you could do an, a direct impression smear, for example, or potentially a tape impression from some of these sites around the nose to see whether you can see any evidence of a bacterial infection. Because if there was, I would be tempted to probably um, use some antimicrobial treatment first of all. Um, and in a, in a situation like this, although obviously we try and avoid oral antibiotics, um, it might be prudent to actually give a course of oral antibiotics rather than shampooing in this case, just because of the location. So I think if you're unsure, it's, it's sometimes a good idea to, to, to try with antimicrobial treatment first of all. Having said that, if you do get to the point of confirming DLE, well, um, UV avoidance is one of the first things that we need to think about because in all forms of lupus, um, UV light exposure has been linked to the atiopathogenesis. So we do need to think about that. Now, that's, that could just be a case of trying to avoid sunny times of the day, which in the UK is not all that difficult. Um, or you might um, need to try and put some sun block on the site. Now, that, that's easier said than done, um, but some dogs might let you do that. If you've got a, a dog that's uh, amenable to th things being put on their noses, a topical tacrolimus cream is one of the treatments that we often reach for, uh, first of all, in DLE. Um, tacrolimus is a, a calcineurin inhibitor, 
um, but it's, it's a little bit similar to cyclosporin, but in a cream form. Um, it's not licensed um, and it is very expensive. It's a human product. So it's in the region of about 85, 90 pound a tube, um, but obviously only small amounts need to be applied. Um, but um, this is a treatment that is, is, does seem to, to work quite well in these cases. And the advantage of applying something topically is that um, you are avoiding medicating the whole dog. It's quite a localised problem. A common uh, problem is obviously how do you stop the dog's just the, the tongue just going straight up and licking it? Well, that can usually be avoided by um, occupying their mouth with a chew toy or a game or something for a few minutes afterwards, or maybe feeding them immediately afterwards. Um, you know, li little little ta tactics like that can sometimes help. Oral and topical corticosteroids um, can also be used for these cases. I would really try and avoid oral corticosteroids where possible uh, for such a localised problem like this. And obviously topical corticosteroids would need to be used um, carefully uh, to avoid uh, the sort of ongoing long-term implications of, of them. Um, cyclosporin given orally um, would be an option um, for more uh, difficult to control cases. Uh, vitamin E and uh, all essential fatty acids can be useful in milder cases or as adjunct um, treatment to other things. And then finally, tetracycline and niacinamide is something is a combination therapy that you may see in older textbooks. But really, for most of the immune mediated conditions of dogs uh, these days, that combination has fallen out of favour just because of the prudent use of antimicrobials. Um, so it's been a long time since I've actually sort of given that and try and avoid that if possible. So you can see when when there's a whole list of various options, you get you can get a pretty good idea. There's no one. Um, standout best treatment. It's a, it's a, it's going down the list depending on how severe the case is. Now, now this picture um, is is relatively um, minor. Um, we still probably got someone with a microphone on. Um, is it, if I can just re remind all delegates just to hover there um, into the centre of the screen uh, with their computer mouse, you should be able to see a banner. And if you can just click the microphone icon and the camera icon they should have a diagonal line going through both of those icons so that I can't, so that all the delegates can't hear each other. You should only be able to hear me. So if everyone can just make sure that you do cross through both of those icons in the middle of the screen, that'd be great. Okay, so um, that's, uh, those are the treatment options for DLE. Um, so in this case, uh, Missy was a, a very well behaved little dog. She wasn't an aggressive German Shepherd. Um, and we decided to treat her with topical tacrolimus. Uh, the trade name of that cream is Protopic, and we do normally use the 0.1% uh, strength of that initially, um, and normally applied twice a day to start with, and then once you get the condition under control, we like to try and uh, wean that down to the lowest possible levels that control the problem. Um, now, as I said, this is a, this is a relatively mild um, example of DLA. Sometimes they're much more um, ulcerated than this, um, and sometimes ta topical tacrolimus might not be uh, enough on its own. Uh, we also obviously gave this owner um, instructions to try and avoid uh, UV exposure where possible. And the prognosis for DLA is, DLE is normally pretty good. It is a localised skin problem. It doesn't normally spread to other areas of the body um, and many, most of them can be controlled quite adequately. And I do think you will see this condition from time to time. So this, coupled with pemphigus foliaceus, is probably the sort of immune-mediated skin disorders of dogs uh, that you will see. Okay, on to case number three. Uh, we have Arthur, a seven-year-old male neutered Labrador, and he presented with a one-month history of purulent skin lesions over his body, face, and ear pinny. And a bacterial culture from his skin surface had been taken prior to referring him, and that had isolated a profuse growth of Staphylococcus pseudintermediates. He had also had biopsies taken prior to coming, and biopsies had demonstrated subcorneal pustules with a catholytic keratinocytes. These are just a few photos of Arthur, Arthur's ears, um, and hopefully you can make out that we have um, some intact pustules here, uh, some of which are, are no longer intact, so you have this sort of yellowing, yellowy crusts um, on the ear pinny. But, you know, I'm sure you'll all agree, this is quite an unusual presentation to see pustules um, and crusts like this on a dog's ear pinna. Um, just bacterial infections are, are very, very uncommon um, on, in this sort of location on the faces of dogs. 
problem list in this case? Well, pustular skin disease. So um, quite straightforward. We need to think about differentials that could result in pustules in a dog. So by far the most common scenario here would be superficial bacterial folliculitis. You'll be diagnosing this every single day of the week, I'm sure, although perhaps not at the moment through the medium of video consults and that and so forth. But very, very common. It would be quite uncommon, as I said, though, to find on the face and the ear pinny. Pustular dermatophytosis can also uh, result in pustules and can be seen on the face. So I mentioned we can get these facially orientated dermatophyte infections of dogs. So that needs to be on the list. Um, impetigo causes pustules, but that's more commonly seen on the sort of ventral areas of young dogs. Impetigo is actually a pustular disorder not involving the haired um, skin. Pemphigus foliaceus would need to be on the list because that is a pustular disorder. It's a, a sterile immune-mediated pustular disorder and can be certainly seen on the face. Sterile pustular erythroderma is another uh, immune-mediated condition more commonly seen and associated with schnauzers. Um, but nevertheless, if you were to look in the book, um, in the books of pustular disorders, you would see that. Uh, we can get pustular drug reactions as well. So we always need to remember that drugs are very good at causing all sorts of abnormal and, and, and weird um, responses and pustular drug reactions um, uh, can certainly be seen. And then finally, candidiasis, uh, very uncommon, um, but I just put it on the list because if you look in the textbooks, candida can result in pustular skin, skin disease in dogs, but would be very unusual in this location. So in this case, we obviously had our biopsies already and they revealed subcorneal pustular dermatitis with a canthalytic keratinocytes which is most consistent with pemphigus foliaceus. So acanthalytic keratinocytes are keratinocytes that have lost connections to one another through the desmosomes, which normally anchor the keratinocytes to one another. So they, they separate because there's immune-mediated attack at those junctions. And what, what happens because of the, um, that process occurring in the stratum spinosum and stratum granulosum, we get subcorneal pustules, which means pustules below the stratum corneum in, in the epidermis. And the face and the pinny are really classic sight. Oh, sorry, just a bit of interference to someone's microphone then. Um, so the face and the ear pinny are really classic sites um, for pemphigus foliaceus. And um, so therefore, that is the most likely diagnosis at this stage. Now, it's just worth mentioning that we can occasionally get a catalytic keratinocytes associated with bacterial pyoderma and also with dermatophytosis. So that's where sometimes some of the confusion um, exists and that's why sometimes it's then up to us as clinicians to be able to make the final diagnosis. In the majority of cases in dogs and cats, uh, pemphigus foliaceus is an idiopathic um, autoimmune disease, but there are situations where PF, pemphigus foliaceus, have been drug-related. Um, there have been some links to old spot-on products that are no longer uh, available. Um, and you can get um, pemphigus-triggered pustular dis disease um, as a drug reaction, um, which can look very, very like pemphigus foliaceus. So it's just worth remembering that drugs can trigger this, but the vast majority of these see have no identifiable underlying cause. So we've got the diagnosis on the biopsy, but like I said, there's still a little bit of uncertainty about whether there might be some involvement of, of pyoderma or dermatophytosis. So one further thing that we could potentially do would be do some cytology. So if you see those intact pustules, you could, you could prick those with a sterile needle and get a, get a sample of that pustular contents onto a glass slide. And then you can actually then stain that and look at it yourself. And that can be really, really helpful because obviously I mentioned that in this case we'd had uh, a swab result of staph pseudintermedius growing prior to being referred. And uh, an easy way of checking how relevant that would be would be just to look at the pustular contents yourself and see whether we can see any evidence of bacterial infection in that pustular contents. Because if it was a pyoderma and that culture result was significant, you would expect to see uh, cockroid shaped bacteria. Having said that, the swab I said um, in the initial slide had just come from the skin surface. So it could well just be a, a growth of staph pseudintermedius just um, uh, coincidentally or incidentally just on the skin 
um, that's not actually anything to do with this disease process. So cytology from the intact puzzle is important. If you get good at cytology as well, you can also get sort of um, information that can help to confirm that you are genuinely dealing with pemphigus. So this um, uh, slide, um, this picture on the right hand side of the screen here, shows the nucleated keratinocytes in the middle here, which sort of separate off in little wraps, um, attached in little groups. And you can see these um, neutrophils in the background here, which don't have any intracellular cocci in them at all. So this is in keeping with it being a sterile process. But these nucleated skin cells are there because they've been they've separated um, in the deeper layers of the skin um, where they still have a nucleus. So that tells you um, that these acanthritic cells are, are coming from where pemphigus um, is occurring. And, and that helps to confirm um, what the biopsy report um, has, has already told you. You could also potentially do a wood sample examination and dermatophyte culture to further uh, rule out dermatophytosis um, if, you, if you want to. So how do we treat pemphigus foliaceus? Well, the mainstay of treatment is still uh, with corticosteroids, and that is normally with prednisolone. At the present moment, there isn't really any evidence that using any sort of combination therapy of different of sort of two or three immunosuppressives together necessarily is any more effective. So we do tend to start off with corticosteroids, and we do obviously need to use immunosuppressive doses uh, to control this sort of problem. Now, for some dogs, they will not tolerate that sort of level of medication, and normally in those dogs, um, or in the dogs that you just cannot get into remission adequately uh, with steroids, uh, where we add in other drugs. And azathioprine would probably be the drug that has been sort of mentioned uh, for the longest. Um, the cyclosporin will, can also be added in, Interestingly, cyclosporin on, on its own is not very effective, but, but coupled with steroids uh, is often quite effective. And in mycophen like Mofetel, um, it, it is also used um, in some instances uh, because it's uh, generally um, similar-ish to azathioprine, but it's generally tolerated better. In some cases, you could also consider topical therapy, so topical corticosteroid, potentially topical calcineurin inhibitors like tacrolimus, uh, the protopic cream as well. And they can be, the topical therapies can be useful for any sort of stubborn areas that are difficult to get under control. So in this case, Arthur was treated with corticosteroids, um, but he actually didn't do very well on those. So we had to um, add in um, azathioprine in his case. And we also used some topical corticosteroids um, on the pinna. Um, because the ears were, despite azathioprine and steroids, they were extremely difficult to control. Um, and they remained uh, with active pustules. But the prognosis is very variable with pemphigus, particularly in dogs. So some dogs do really well. You get them into remission. They get down to a very nice low alternate day uh, dosing regime um, of something like just steroid on its own. Other, drug, other dogs can be an absolute nightmare to control. Um, I've even had some dogs and cats that are, that are pretty much impossible to control. Um, even with multiple immunosuppressives used at the same time. Um, so it is very variable and therefore it is worth having that discussion with owners uh, that, that it is very variable and not to give them any sort of false hope that, we're gonna, that you're going to be able to get the, the dog back to normal uh, because it, it can be uh, very severe in some cases. So I do think you're going to see pemphigus uh, foliaceus uh, reported to be the most common autoimmune skin disease in dogs. Okay, now on to case four. This is Bonnie, um, an eight-month-old female entire boxer. And she presented with quite an unusual history, actually, uh, of just a very short six-day history of, of what the owners described as lumps coming up all over the skin. And over that six-day course, she'd been back and forth to her local vets, and the lesions had been responsive to short-acting injectable dexamethasone on several occasions. They'd gone down really quite nicely, just disappeared, but then they'd just come up really very quickly once those injections had worn off. And on one occasion, Bonnie's face had also appeared puffy to the owners, but that had only occurred on one occasion. And actually, right at the start, um, the, the vets had also taken some biopsies, and these had just come back prior to referral, and very unusually, had revealed completely normal skin. So that is, that is extremely unusual to get that back from the pathologist, uh, but they really didn't have much to comment at all. So this is a picture from um, Bonnie's owners, 
Um, I didn't take this because when I actually saw her, she actually didn't have the lumps because they were sort of so transient. Um, but this was a picture from home. So you can see that some of these um, lumps are quite large, um, you know, a good couple of centimetres in diameter. Certainly they could be described as nodular uh, lesions within the skin or plaques. So the definition of a plaque is a, is a raised lesion that is wider than it is high. So problem list, well, the description of the lesions being transient and responsive to corticosteroid injections is most consistent with wheels. And wheels can be defined as discrete erythematous edematous circumscribed swellings with a flat top and steep walls. If you think about some differentials, so I suppose I'm just thinking about differentials just purely about how this dog looks to start with, but by far the top of the list at this point would be urticaria, knowing uh, the history, knowing that we think these lesions are likely to be wheels, um, urticaria would certainly be at the top of the list. But potentially, when I really started to think about some other differentials that could look like this, even you know, without you touching the dog or knowing anything much about the history, you could potentially get superficial bacterial folliculitis in a short-coated dog like a boxer presenting with uh, little lumps like this because uh, it, can, it can mimic lumps in the skin because we have these little tufts of hair standing up on end. Early erythema multiforme, before it starts to develop uh, into things like erosions and ulcers, um, could also look like this. Vasculitis would be on the list, as would uh, multiple mast cell tumours. I think the, the history obviously doesn't really quite fit with that being such an acute onset. And then potentially lymphoma as well. This is a boxer dog. Um, but again, the history is very, very uh, short um, in this case. So this would be one where uh, some of these other differentials would seem pretty unlikely. So we have, um, you know, this history, very acute onset, corticosteroid responsive. Um, it is all most consistent with urticaria. And urticaria causes edema and sometimes some perivascular inflammation. But if you take biopsies at the wrong time, if you like, in inverted commas, then sometimes the skin can just appear normal on histology. So that, that does fit in this case as to why there wasn't much found. Uh, also, the other main differentials that I just listed there uh, would all be ruled out really by the fact that they'd all cause characteristic changes on um, biopsies um, and the lesions would also just not be so transient as well. So treatment, um, really urticaria has many, many causes. Some are immunological, some are non-immunological. And if it's immunological, we're really a classic example of a type 1 hypersensitivity response. But there are quite a few triggers. Now, the most common triggers in dogs are adverse food reactions, drug reactions, and stings and bites. But we can have other uh, reactions like contact reactions, even um, adverse reactions to intestinal parasites, um, infections. And then we have some non-immunological uh, reactions uh, like um, a, a, a bizarre reaction to heat or cold um, presenting with urticaria. Uh, dermatographism is pressure-induced uh, urticaria whereby um, pressure, like in the books you'll see this as sort of uh, drawing on the skin, provokes uh, urticaria in the skin. And then also vasculitis would also uh, potentially be on the list as a trigger for urticaria. So quite a few uh, to think about here. Um, and you, know, you could potentially get um, embroiled in quite a lengthy uh, investigation trying to work out the cause uh, in some of these cases. So the treatment involves a search for the trigger, and that does normally start off with a drug and vaccine history. So you really need to interrogate the owner as to what might have been given, and that includes things they might have given and sourced off the internet, not necessarily medications that they've got on prescription. And it will often also start with an exclusion diet trial. Now, in Bonnie's case, there was absolutely nothing in her history to suggest a drug um, reaction. Um, and she'd not had any vaccinations any, you know, re recently at all. So we started her on an exclusion dietary trial with a hydrolyzed diet. Uh, I can't remember the exact one. It was quite a while ago, but it was one of the hydrolyzed diets. And in her case, that actually uh, proved to be curative. So she just never had urticaria coming up again. Um, since she went off that diet, after going on to that diet. Now, in, in the ideal world, obviously, to confirm the diagnosis, we would then challenge her with her old diet and see that she then develops urticaria again. But actually, that's a little bit questionable as to whether that's ethical, ethical because uh, I mentioned that on one occasion she developed this puffy face, uh, which is then starting to develop into more sort of angioedema 
which is the, the sort of where urticaria becomes more uh, advanced and more uh, diffuse under the skin. And so therefore, uh, the owners weren't really keen to do this. So you could argue that we haven't really um, ever completely um, nailed down the diagnosis, but she stayed on this diet for, you know, for an extended period of time with, lot, you know, with follow-up, and she had no further flare-up. So obviously, the longer she goes on on that diet without any problems, the more likely that was that that was the, the accurate uh, diagnosis. But as I said, if the trigger cannot be found, the prognosis is more uncertain, and some dogs do require long-term medication. So I suppose one of the worst-case scenarios here would that be a dog with this sort of problem might have to be managed with something such as a steroid um, or, or other immunosuppressive, potentially, ongoing um, to try and prevent this if the trigger just cannot be found. I have never seen that happen. Um, I think uh, to carry this sort of presentation in dogs is quite rare. Um, certainly when we used to see the horses um, in my time at the RBC, that was pretty common. But in small animals, it's quite a rare presentation. So this is what she looked like at the end. Uh, she was a very happy, young, um, healthy dog, and she went away on her hydrolyzed diet. And she was lost to follow up eventually. But I, I believe they just, uh, the owners decided just to carry on with the diet. Okay, so final case uh, for this evening's session. We've got Rosie a one-year-old female neutered French bulldog, and she presented with an eight-week history of marked pruritus and severe dermatitis on the limbs and ventrum, with bleeding and discharging furuncles. So this dog was really in quite a bad way uh, when I saw her, and coupled with that, we've got, we had quite a distressed owner because she probably spent quite a lot of money on this French bulldog, and the dog's only one year of age, um, and for you know a decent chunk of this dog's life, uh, she's had very severe uh, dermatitis. Bit of relevant history, her owner had been using imidacloprid spot on uh, religiously every month for the control of fleas. And this, throughout the eight week periods, this problem had just been progressing. So it's definitely not static, it's just been getting worse and worse. And the, the dog um, was becoming quite lethargic and uh, reluctant to go for walks at the time of referral. So this is the picture. She was, um, despite being uh, reluctant to go for a walk and uh, lethargic, she was quite difficult to keep still for a photo. This is why she's not looking nicely at the camera here. But hopefully you can all see that she has really quite severe dermatitis affecting um, all four feet and the distal limbs, uh, particularly um, on the hind limbs. Just some close-up views as well. And the picture on the left, you can just see that actually she's got a really severe dermatitis. Um, on the ventrum here, um, around her, her nipples as well. Um, this sort of extended along uh, the ventrum and really use all of the back leg really goes right up into the sort of groin, um, continuous really with this ventrum area uh, is really, really severe. And you can just see how swollen um, and, and um, edematous these limbs are. This area here actually was where um, we actually had just purulent um, fluid just seeping out from this swollen leg. So really, really quite severe. And you can see why a dog with these sort of skin lesions might be lethargic. What's our problem list? Well, a little bit more tricky in, in this case because we've got um, a few different sort of presenting problems. But basically, pruritus would be uh, an important one to focus on. She's very pruritic. And the other one that would be quite helpful just to think about would be differentials for what might result in bleeding or, and or discharging furuncles. When thinking about pruritus, um, you know, you don't really need me to go through these because I'm sure you do, do, do this in your heads every single day in general practice. But uh, the main differentials would be uh, ectoparasites. Um, so uh, there's obviously loads of them, um, but uh, certainly they'd be a common cause of pruritus. Uh, microbial infections, bacterial and fungal, allergic skin disease and neoplastic disease would be the sort of main um, categories of what would result in pruritus in, in a dog. Um, neoplasia would obviously be quite unlikely in such a young dog, but not impossible. When I thought about differentials for bleeding for uncles, well, um, you could also get ectoparasites, such as demodex, resulting um, in for uncles like that. A deep microbial infection with bacteria could certainly result in that, um, and the, the pustular, uh, the purulent discharge and the edema. Potentially, um, you could get widespread actinic disease um, due to furuncles, but that is uh, very unlikely. Actinic disease means sort of UV-induced, 
Um, so that seems unlikely. It's, it's mentioned in the textbooks, but in the UK, I don't think I've ever really seen that. And the textbooks would also potentially say immunological dysfunction, which is a relatively non-specific thing. Um, so you can see there's not a huge list of possible uh, scenarios here for these bleeding peruncles. So with this dog's young age, uh, feet and limbs affected and no acaricidal treatment in her history, I really consider demodicosis to be most likely, given the fact demod demodex might crop up on the differential list of both of our two presenting problems. Um, I mentioned that she'd been receiving imidacloprid spot on, but imidacloprid is just an insecticide. Um, she hadn't been having um, imidacloprid and moxidectin, for example. So in this case, hair plucks and skin scrapings are indicated to look for demodex. And also it'd be very important to perform some cytology of any discharging lesion uh, to see whether there's any evidence of bacterial infection. And that was quite easily achieved just by uh, basically pressing a glass slide onto uh, that area of oozing purulent uh, fluid. You might also at this point want to take a culture um, from, uh, of that fluid because if you, if you do diagnose a bacterial infection, it is quite likely you might want to culture as well because you might be um, anticipating having to use quite a lengthy course of antibiotics in a case like this. You could also get the woods lamp out potentially and also perform a fungal culture if you wanted to more thoroughly rule out um, uh, dermatophytosis. And I, I guess I would be thinking more along the lines of doing this if my initial diagnostic tests uh, were, were, were negative. So this is what we found um, on her. So um, clear diagnosis of um, demodicosis. Um, in this case, she was absolutely teeming uh, with demodex mites. Um, so uh, my preferred technique is, uh, is to do hair plucks to start with, um, just because, especially if you're, if, you're, if you're sampling dogs around the face or the feet, just plucking a few hairs out is normally very, very easy to do, even if uh, dogs are sore or um, not very cooperative, it's possible to do that. And if you get your diagnosis just performing the hair plucks, um, then you don't need to do anything else. Having said that, if you've got a high index of suspicion and you don't find anything on hair plucks, then you should then do skin scrapes to, to, to fully rule out Demodex as well. But I think in a dog like this, I think going doing deep skin scrapes from that dog's feet would be potentially very sore. Um, and you might even need to think about some sort of sedation Whereas in a hair pluck, um, uh, hair plucks you just don't need to do that at all. It's very easy to do, um, and you can do that with the owner just holding in the contact and very easily. So I'm sure you're all very familiar with seeing Demodex, um, and if you would see a sample like this, uh, you wouldn't have a problem making the diagnosis. This is the cytology that you get from the, the, the prevalent fluid. You can see we've got a very profuse neutrophilic um, infiltrate, and we have intracellular coccoid-shaped bacteria confirming that we have a secondary bacterial infection, um, which is not a massive surprise given, you, given we see the severity of this dog's problem. Um, and that, that probably explains why this dog's becoming uh, very um, lethargic and, and somewhat unwell because of, because of how severe it is. So this would be a case of juvenile onset generalized medicosis. This dog is, is very young and it can be one of the most severe skin diseases of dogs. The prognosis should, however, be good because, should be good because in, in young dogs, it's thought this immunological dysfunction is not a widespread thing whereby they become unwell for other reasons. It seems to be a mite-specific uh, defect that allows the mites to proliferate uh, when, when young, um, and it's not something they then go on and seem to suffer with uh, later on in life. So most dogs do well if you can treat them um, adequately. Now, there are various treatments, as I'm sure you will know, uh, moxidectin and imidacloprid spot on um, is licensed, um, but is generally uh, not very effective in the more severe cases. It would probably be best reserved for the milder cases. These other drugs that I put in brackets um, are mentioned in sort of all the sort of international treatment guidelines for demodicosis. Um, in fact, uh, the World Association of Veterinary Dermatology has just published in the, the, very, the very last edition of the Veterinary Dermatology Journal uh, clinical consensus guidelines on how to manage demodicosis. So if any of you are interested, um, you can look that up and that's really just um, only just sort of hot off the press. Um, but these drugs in the um, brackets are established recognised treatments that um, have, have 
uh, with proven efficacy, but they're not licensed. So that's the main problem. Um, now, we have the isoxazoline drugs these days, obviously, such as oral fluorolena, um, afoxalena and sarolena, and they now have a license for demidicosis. They have proven efficacy, and they would be my treatment of choice uh, for uh, demidicosis cases like this. This dog would obviously also need concurrent treatment of the deep pyoderma. And because it's a deep pyoderma and you're likely to need oral antibiotics for quite some time, I would also um, submit a culture ideally from this, uh, this dog's lesions if money permitted. So Rosie was treated with a monthly oral sarolena at the time. At the time I saw this dog, sarolena was actually the only isoxazoline that had a, a UK license for demidicosis. Um, but she did really well. She was monitored every four weeks, but she did really, really well um, and went on to make a full recovery. She did have six weeks of oral antibiotics, and we did also use a topical shampoo on her based on chlorhexidine uh, to try and speed up resolution of the pyoderma. And she did really well and, and was maintained um, you know, in, the, in, the, in, in long term remission. Uh, many owners of dogs like this would often choose to use an isoxazoline drug um, ongoing just as the routine flea and tick preventative treatment um, and just to prevent this sort of thing happening again. So actually, I think in cases like this, often, um, you know, seeing them back and performing the skin scrapes and hair pluckings every month until uh, clinical cure can be, can be um, well, the need to do that can be less these days because many owners just to make the decision to just carry on treatment indefinitely, essentially. So I think it's, uh, it's something that owners aren't always all that keen to necessarily come back when their dogs are clearly doing well and, and on, on the necessary treatment long term. Okay, so that completes my five cases. I hope that was a useful little run through. Um, we finished pretty much dead on the hour. So what I just need to do now is stop sharing my screen and I should be able to then go into uh, the chat function and just see whether we have any questions. So uh, we do have a few questions. So I'm just going to see whether I can um, just scroll back through this. Just bear with me a second. Um, apologies, there's a few comments saying there's a lot of background noise. Um, I, did, I think generally that did seem to improve towards the end. We're all new to this. Uh, this is the very first um, Microsoft Teams uh, webinar that we've done, um, but uh, I think it, we we do, obviously everyone does need to make sure that we do have it all muted. Um, so let me just scroll down and see whether we've got any questions. Does, there, does anyone, if anyone has any questions now, you can post them in the chat box um, if you like. Um, otherwise, I'm just seeing, and I can't particularly see any other, any other questions, which means that you might be all happy. So if that is the case, um, that's absolutely fine. Otherwise, Hello, John. oh hi there. I can hear someone. Hi. Um. Um. I have a question in the last uh, case. Okay. Um. As the dog was so uh, itchy, would you use anything uh, for the itchiness uh, except from the um, other treatment uh, for the initial days or week or something, just to make her a little bit more comfortable? Or? I think that's a good question and it's something that owners often really want um, to have. Uh, it's not uncommon actually that I've seen dogs like this in the past actually on prednisolone um, at the time of referral just because vets and owners get desperate quite understandably in a case like this. But uh, what I would do honestly is, is do everything possible to avoid giving anything I must say because if you can get the dog on appropriate antibiotics and um, you know up to a large extent the topical washing will be therapeutic in that case as well and get them onto an appropriate treatment for the mite usually their discomfort will really start to improve very quickly so I I personally would try and avoid that if you have to use something um, any of the sort of antipyritic drugs I suppose it's interesting to think whether cytopoint might be uh, a good one to try. I, I personally haven't used that in, in that scenario, but I guess that would be the one that would perhaps have less or least um, detrimental effect on the immune response uh, to, um, to the demodicosis potentially, although there's no sort of evidence-based guidance to, to back up that statement. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, I've got another question here that's just come through on the chat. And this says, is there an advantage in using azathioprine over cyclosporine for pemphigus cases when reaching for a second drug? So um, I would say that there 
the only advantage would be potentially a cost saving one. So azathioprine um, is obviously very cheap to buy, uh, that whereby you would have to factor in the fact that you need to do regular blood monitoring. Um, and that um, <laughs> ideally would be done at baseline and then repeated every two weeks, um, certainly for the first month. <laughs> I think it's always hard to make firm recommendations about how often the testing needs to be done because it always has to be tailored to owner finances, for example. But that is the main reason to use azathioprine. Plus, the other reason potentially is that if you look in the literature, which some of it, some of which is quite old, um, azathioprine is tended to be the drug used most commonly. But these days, I would often use cyclosporine first of all because of the fact it's usually tolerated better. You don't have to do the blood monitoring. Um, and most owners would tend to prefer the uh, cyclosporine alongside the steroid. Okay, hopefully that answers the question. Um, any other questions? Are we all happy to go and um, enjoy, well, tolerate the rest of the evening in lockdown? Oh, I've got a question here about what differentials I would consider in a nine-year-old cat with that the rest of the message is missing. So that's a that's a challenging one to answer at this stage. I'll just wait a few seconds to see whether the rest of that um, message comes through. Um, but we're getting a few comments to say thank you. So I'm glad that the talk managed to work okay and the, the medium of video worked okay. Um, so uh, once we once we got rid of the, uh, the the noise of the cutlery, we were all fine. Okay, well I, I think I think I'll probably say um, good night to everyone. Thank you all very much for um, joining us, and we hope to see you all soon uh, for another webinar um, soon with us. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Great meeting. <laughs>